Okay, Ramesh, I guess you're up first. Go ahead, my friend. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the BAPS Swamiran Complex. We are very excited as we launch Ontario's first provincial vaccine clinic in the presence of Premier Doug Ford. In the joy of others lies our own. This motto of Pramukh Swami Maharaj, the founder of BAPS Charities, has driven the dedication and activities of the organization to serve communities around the world. We are proud to say that these motivating words continue to inspire community support even in the midst of a pandemic. Over the past 14 months, BAPS Charities has supported communities in Ontario and across Canada by donating PPE, distributing care packages, making phone calls of support, educating people through webinars, and organizing other in initiatives. Most recently, in the month of March, BAPS Charities distributed more than 130,000 surgical grade masks to families and communities across Ontario and Canada, and over 20,000 pounds of non-perishable food to food banks. During this pandemic, His Holiness Mahan Swami Maharaj, the inspirer of BAPS, has encouraged volunteers to help in local communities where possible, following the rules and guidelines of the government. BAPS has organized similar vaccine clinics in our centers in the USA, India, and England as needed. We thank the government of Ontario for selecting BAPS charities and to give us this opportunity to host a vaccine clinic here and serve the community. I would also like to thank the Ministry of Health for their support and applaud the volunteers of BAPS Charities who have stepped up, many taking time off from work to help set up and run this clinic to serve the community. We encourage everyone to take advantage of such clinics and remind everyone that even after you receive your first dose, it is very important to continue following Ontario's public health guidelines. It is now my pleasure to welcome Premier Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, and request him to address the community. Thank you. Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you, Yogesh, for that introduction. And thanks to the BAPS Charities for hosting us here today at the site of this vac new vaccine clinic. BAPS Charities has really stepped up throughout the pandemic, donating more than 130,000 masks to communities right across this country. And their volunteers have now taken on a challenge of setting up this pop-up vaccine clinic as part of our accelerated rollout to get needles into arms in high-risk neighborhoods. As we continue to make steady progress vaccinating our seniors and most vulnerable, they're helping get vaccines to the residential and industrial neighbors here in Etobicoke, many of whom are essential workers. It's incredible, and I want to thank you again for what you're doing right here. I want to also recognize Councillor Michael Ford, who is here with us today, and thank him for his incredible work on behalf of the great people of Etobicoke North. And my friends, we're relying on vaccination sites just like this one, vaccine clinics that will get thousands of shots done in the heart of communities where they will have the greatest impact in our fight against COVID-19. Because getting ahead of this virus, ending these lockdowns, reopening our schools, getting our small businesses back on their feet, will all come down to one thing, vaccines. How fast we get vaccines into our province and into arms. How fast we can vaccinate critical mass of the population. The faster we get to that critical mass, the faster we can end lockdowns, open schools, and get life back to normal. And we all have a part to play. 
We need the federal government to continue leading the charge on getting us as many vaccines as possible. We need each of you to sign up and get your vaccine as soon as you're eligible. And for our part, we will continue building up capacity to get shots in arms. Over the past few months, we have ramped up our vaccine infrastructure. We now have the capacity to do millions of vaccines a month. And our capacity to get needles into arms grows every day. Where they are needed most, with the new clinics like this one at the BAPS Temple. Last Friday, we expanded vaccine eligibility to all adults 50 and older in COVID hotspots. Yesterday, we began vaccinating education workers in hotspots, neighborhoods in Peel and in Toronto. We have special teams across the province in hotspot communities vaccinating those at greatest risk of infection, including essential workers who cannot work from home. Because it's critical that we stop COVID in these communities where it is spreading the fastest. That's why we're protecting those most at risk in 114 highly impacted neighborhoods across the province. This pop-up clinic will begin vaccinating local residents starting tomorrow. Community outreach will be led by the best people for the job, BAPS charities, William Osler Health System, and local community organizations. These are the people with strong relationships with the surrounding community. These are the people who can build trust to combat vaccine hesitancy and protect their most vulnerable. At mobile vaccine clinics like BAPS and other high-risk neighborhoods, we are beginning to vaccinate adults 18 and over. We're opening employer-operated vaccine clinics right at the job sites. They're also vaccinating residents of surrounding communities. This is how we're protecting our workers and who can't work and, and go uh, work at home, I should say. Uh, that's how we're gonna protect these folks. We're fighting the virus with everything we've got and vaccines remain our best defense. We have managed to vaccinate over 3.3 million Ontarians so far and our pace of vaccine delivery is increasing rapidly. We're getting vaccines in arms as soon as we receive them. If we receive a steady supply of vaccine from the federal government, we expect to vaccinate 9 million Ontarians between April and the end of June. In the meantime, we must all do our part now and stay home to save lives. Before I hand it over to NPP and on, I want to wish our incredible Health Minister and Deputy Premier, Christine Elliott, a very happy birthday. Happy birthday, Christine. Actually, I called Christine and sang her a little song this morning, left it on her, her voicemail. Um, I'll, I'll never make a career out of singing, I'll tell you that. But I'll, I'll tell you, Christine, as, as you've seen right from the beginning, has uh, worked hard to help uh, keep us safe throughout this whole pandemic and has stood side by side with me uh, right from the get-go, so we're very, very grateful to have Christine with us. I want to thank you, and God bless the people of Ontario. Now, I'll hand it over to MPP Anon. Thank you, Premier. Namaste, and Jai Swami Narayan. Good afternoon, everybody. It is my pleasure to be here with my brother, big brother, I call it, Premier Ford, Minister Elliott, and Minister, happy birthday once again, uh, Solicitor Jones, and my neighbour, uh, Councillor Michael Ford and with the members of BAPS, Swami Narayan Mandir, Naresh Bhai, Yogesh Bhai, Deepan Bhai, Deepak Ruprelji, Vikram Khurana, and Parag Bhai. So thank you for all the blessings and inviting us today. Uh, what a wonderful week this has been. Started with the uh, last week was Easter Monday. I had the opportunity to visit church. And today is the first day of holy uh, month of Ramadan. We have Visakhi today, we have a Hindu New Year today, and a Navratri. So all the blessings are coming together. And our places of worship continue to be a pillar of strength in our community throughout the pandemic. And it's heartwarming to once again see them stepping forward to protect the communities across the province. As Premier said, 
time and time again, the health and safety of all Ontarians has always been the province's top priority, and the vaccine will play an essential role in stopping COVID-19 and at its tracks. Our government understands that not all individuals can easily travel for a vaccination appointment. That is why we are bringing vaccine closer to you, closer to home. Ontario's mobile vaccine clinics will ensure that our most vulnerable, as well as the resident living in hot spots like my community, neighborhoods highly impacted by the pandemic are well protected and help to reduce the transmission of COVID-19. I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all healthcare heroes, public health units, and the province for their tireless effort in making this possible. At this time, I want to say, Mere Ontario Vasio ko ye mein batana chahta hoon, COVID vaccine ka tika karan aap aur aap ke apno ki suraksha ke liye avashik hai. Aap sab se vinamr vinti hai ki jab bhi aap ki bari aay, aap tika karan ka appointment jaldi se banayin aur jaldi se jaldi tika lagwayin. Aan samay chhe tumhari bai uchi karne ne COVID-19 ri rasi lehi leo. I wanna say thank you and as I say, as uh, Swamiji said, in joy of other lies ours, it is time for us to roll up our sleeves. Thank you so much. We'll go to the phone line for questions. First question, please. From Randy Rapp at CHCHTV. Please go ahead. Hey, Randy. Hi, Premier. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering about uh, the suspension of the use of Johnson & Johnson, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the United States. Um, is it going to have uh, an impact on our vaccine um, rollout? And uh, are you worried that it's going to create more vaccine hesitancy, hesitancy on top of what is already looking like a lot of hesitancy? Yeah, I, I heard about that. And, and I guess we're going to have to uh, wait to get the advice off Health Canada. And uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll pass this over to the Minister of Health. but. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm concerned when I when I hear that uh, coming down from the the U.S., but I'll I'll pass it over to Minister Elliott. Well, thank you, Randy. This is an issue that we are, of course, concerned about. But as you're probably aware, we don't have any of the JNGA vaccines in uh, Canada yet. But we will be following this with the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations as well as Health Canada. Uh, to make sure that before any J&J &J is put into anyone's arms in Ontario, we need to know that it's going to be effective, but more importantly, that it's going to be safe. So we're following the, uh, this very closely, and we'll be, uh, I'm, Dr. Williams will be speaking with NACI and Public Health uh, Canada with respect to this issue. Follow-up? Yeah, we seem to be having uh, a degree of vaccine envy among the various uh, public health units. Now, um, it's understandable that, that the vaccine will go to people 18 plus in, in Toronto hot zones and, and Peel hot zones, but when do you foresee people 18 plus in hot zones around the province, not just in those two jurisdictions, being able to receive it? Yeah, Randy, it all, it all depends on uh, the supply. If we get more uh, supply off the feds, and I know they're working hard, um, but we just need the, the supply. We have, uh, I, I guess it's even gone up since yesterday, but it was uh, 2.8 million people have appointments and, and uh, we're just waiting for more supply. We're ramping up uh, pharmacies, uh, up to 1,400 pharmacies. Keep in mind, we have 3,200 altogether, but as soon as we get that supply, we'll continue ramping it up. Uh, Toronto again opened up uh, vaccine uh, clinics, uh, three of them. And then we, we have uh, places like uh, BAPS uh, Charities right, right here that opened up and we're trying to do that to other areas right across uh, the hotspots. So as soon as we get the ample supply, we'll, we'll be able to get that done. And I know everyone's anxious, but it's, it's coming soon, folks. Next question. From Dave Woodard at Global News. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Premier. Uh, my first question is regarding child care centers. We know that they're staying open, but what's the plan that's going to make that happen? Will child care center workers be able to get vaccinated earlier, regardless of where they are? And what kind of um, stuff are you looking at if they do have to close? 
Well, I'm going to, before I pass it over to the Solicitor General, our, our goal is to uh, get as many people uh, vaccinated as, as possible. And I know everyone, um, you know, wants to be f first in line per se. Uh, but right now, we just, we'll wait for the supply and the supply comes in, we'll get to them. I know we're, we're working on uh, the uh, special education uh, uh, teachers right across the province, which is absolutely critical. We're getting teachers in the hotspots vaccinated uh, as, as we speak right now. And our, our goal is to uh, vaccinate uh, those, those folks that take care of child care. But I, I just, without the supply, I, I just wish I could sit here and tell you the exact time. But I will pass it over to the Solicitor General. Well, thank you. As you know, and the Premier just highlighted it, uh, we are dealing with a supply issue. So as we increase, and last, last week we were able to announce that we were moving in to the second phase of our vaccination plan, which of course does include um, vaccinating people and offering vaccines to individuals who cannot work from home. That is part of the second phase, and frankly, it is very much dependent on the supply that we receive. We have done an excellent job of vaccinating the most vulnerable. Uh, we see that in the, um, the long-term care homes and the retirement homes who are not getting the uh, positivity rates and mercifully not having people uh, get sick as much because we focused on the most vulnerable first. We'll continue to do that. And as Premier Ford said, as soon as we have sufficient supplies, we're going to make sure if you can't work from home, you have access to a vaccine. Follow-up. Uh, thank you. And Premier, looking at the hotspots and vaccinations, uh, some are saying that the rollout is still rather confusing. Some people are able to book on the provincial booking site. Others are not allowed to, while still others, like special education workers, uh, can go to mass vaccination sites regardless of age as long as they've got a letter saying that they should. Um, even one of those on your own vaccine task force said the rollout lacked clarity. So my question is, was there a better way to do this effectively? Well, I'm, I'm going to, you know, for the folks that find it confusing, I, I have to tell you that uh, 2.8 million people didn't find it confusing. 3.3 uh, million that we had vaccinated didn't find it confusing. So uh, if I'm doing the math right, we're well over 6 million people that didn't find it confusing. Folks, it's very, very simple. And I'm going to wing this phone number, and please correct me if I'm wrong. It's 888-999-6944. Uh, uh, that's 888-999-6944. Or you can, you can go on the Ontario COVID uh, vaccination site and, and book it. It's, it's as, simple, as simple as that. Uh, we also have organizations, as we go into the, the high-priority neighbourhoods, the hotspots, uh, organizations like uh, BAPS, uh, they, they reach out to their, their congregation and communities. And by the way, folks, when we go into these, these areas and we go into large companies, part of the agreement is you just don't do your, your employees, you just don't do your congregation, you reach out to the whole community uh, in that hot area, hot zone, and, and bring them in. And they have done an incredible job here in, in such short notice. Uh, I, I believe is it in, in the last in an hour you ended up booking like 4,500, uh, roughly 4,500 appointments, and that's really really incredible. And that's why, you know, we're, we're, I know we've been saying this, and we haven't said it. Uh, the people out there haven't been saying it, but we are all in this together. And with uh, community uh, help, uh, we're going to get through this. So people uh, out there, please. Uh, sign up and, and come and get uh, vaccinated as, as soon as possible. Once we get vaccinated, the, the lockdowns, we'll, we'll take those down, schools will go back, people will get back to normal, and uh, it's proven in, in the long-term care and the seniors' residents uh, the effect uh, that vaccines have, and, and they work. They, they work really, really well. Next question. From Colin DeMello at CTV News. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, Premier. Hi, um, the government is relying on businesses to volunteer to set up a vaccine clinic for their employees in high-risk neighborhoods. I'm wondering why your government wants to leave it 
up to those businesses to set up these vaccine clinics as opposed to just relying on the public health units or going to those businesses themselves in order to prevent some of these outbreaks. Yeah, no, no, good, good question, Colin, but it, it's not just the, the businesses, it's a coordinated uh, effort uh, amongst the, the local hospital, be it William Osler here, um, and it, it has uh, a lot to do with the public health units. Um, ourselves and, and organizations reaching out to us, us reaching out to them. I'm, I'm on the phone constantly calling large employers right across the province in hot areas, hot spots, asking them if they're interested in supporting the program. And I have yet to have one person, uh, you know, refuse the call or say they aren't interested. I, I would like to pass it over to the, the Solicitor General. Uh, she's, she's been doing a great job in charge of this. So, Colin, the short answer is why are we asking, encouraging um, organizations like BAPS, like businesses? Speed. We want to get vaccines in people's arms as quickly as possible. And these businesses are openly wanting to be part, willing partners because they understand that it means their employees, their employee families, the communities where they are situated are going to be better protected. I, I in no way believe that businesses and organizations are being in any way encouraged. They want to do this because they know at the end of the day, it means more people get vaccinated and we can do it faster. Thank you. Follow up. Thank you. Uh, we now know that people 18 to 49 can't actually sign up for a vaccine despite you Premier, telling them that they could go get a vaccine. There was certainly a lot of uh, people who wanted to try to book an appointment but found out that they simply couldn't. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, do you feel like that claim that you made last week was misleading? Because, you know, we know a lot of people who are within that age range who felt misled by you. Yeah, well, again, uh, I never uh, mislead anyone. I, I'm uh, very clear uh, right now, if you're in a hot area, a hot zone, um, and let's say an employer, or if you're at BAPS, it's uh, 18 uh, plus. If you go into a company and you're gonna vaccinate uh, that company, it doesn't matter if the person is 21 or 31 or 41 or 51, uh, people wanna, uh, get vaccinated so no not not by any means uh, would we would we do that we want to make sure that we get the the vaccines into people's arms as as quickly as as possible thank you next question from Lorenda Redekop at CBC News please go ahead hi there premier I hi. see in the tech briefing about the vaccination process that AstraZeneca is not listed at all so what does that mean for AstraZeneca going forward and for the pharmacy program? I'll pass that to the Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, we have just received a shipment of AstraZeneca, which will be distributed to pharmacies. We're still waiting to find out the delivery schedule for future uh, deliveries of AstraZeneca. Uh, but we also have the opportunity, if uh, we don't receive it in the near future, we have Moderna that can also be used. And we're also looking at whether Pfizer can be uh, delivered to pharmacies. It has been in other uh, jurisdictions. And so we have to abide by the cold storage requirements, of course. But as we receive supplies, we have to be very nimble and adept at making sure that we deliver them to the appropriate locations and keep them going in supplying vaccines uh, with the goal being to get as many needles into as many arms as possible. Follow up. Um, we've heard talk about the possibility of transferring patients from Ontario hospitals to other provinces where um, they're not as stretched in their ICUs. Has there been any talk with other provinces of possibly uh, having that kind of relationship, uh, for example, to Atlantic Canada? Go, go ahead, Christine. Okay. Well, we, uh, what we're looking at now is building up capacity within Ontario. We know that many other provinces are experiencing difficulties with the variants. Uh, British Columbia, uh, particularly with the Brazilian variant. 
uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan as well. But with respect to uh, workforces, if there are available teams that would be able to come from particularly the Atlantic provinces, we are certainly looking at that as an option, but we're also looking at building up capacity from our own teams by looking at Ontario Health, uh, looking at the LINs, making sure that we can bring in people that can help in, the, uh, in our uh, hospitals as well so that the more experienced staff those with intensive care experience can then move up into our intensive care units to, uh, to care for the number of patients that we have with COVID and who are there for other reasons as well. We'll take the last question from the phone before we go to the floor. From Matt Skube at CTV Ottawa. Please go ahead. Hi, Premier. Thank Hi. you for taking my question. No, I, I wanted to confirm because uh, we have been in touch with Ottawa Public Health here in the city um, that one of the postal codes identified in Ottawa does not have any high priority neighborhoods, and that's the K2V postal code. And uh, again, we've confirmed with them multiple times that uh, there are no priority neighborhoods there, yet it's still listed as a hotspot uh, on, the, on the provincial website. I'm wondering why and what criteria is being used to identify these neighborhood as hotspots if our local public health unit is not identifying it as one? Well, um, I, I'd be more than happy to talk to Dr. Etches uh, about that, but uh, I will pass it over to the, the Minister of Health and they'll uh, explain how the, the health uh, ministry, the Ministry of Health came up with the, the zip codes or postal codes, I should say. Thank you for the question. The hotspot areas were originally identified on the basis of uh, historic data where there had been an acceleration in the number of cases, but it's also being reviewed on a regular basis by our uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health, by Dr. Etches in the case of Ottawa, and by the Public Health Measures Table. And in the case of the Ottawa area that you're speaking of, we are trying to be proactive because we know that there are a number of uh, congregate settings there in terms of uh, retirement homes, long-term care homes, uh, other areas of congregate living, uh, seniors' apartments and so on, where we know that we need to get in there before uh, a, a, an outbreak happens. And so that was the primary reason why that particular location was, was uh, decided upon is because of the high numbers of congregate living within its, its borders. Follow up? I understand that, Minister, but at the same time, the case rate when it comes to postal code in the province is in the 233rd. Uh, when it comes to hospitalization and death rates, 427. Um, those, those seniors would already be covered uh, when it comes to the vaccine, when it comes to the rollout. So uh, again, I, I would go back to, to the point of when it comes to those areas, the seniors are covered and those congregate settings are already covered because they were prioritized first. Um, why is this still been identified as a hotspot and was there any political motivation to that? First of all, with respect to the second part of your question, absolutely no political motivation whatsoever. This was all decided upon the basis of the clinical evidence and the recommendations of the Dr. Etches, the Chief Medical Officer of Health and the Public Health Measures Table. In this particular case, not all of the seniors were covered. There's still many more that are living in congregate living. There's also people with intellectual and physical uh, challenges who are also living in congregate settings. We need to protect them and that was the basis of the decision being made to designate that area as a hotspot. Okay, and we'll just move to the floor for the final question. A little bit of a different pace, but um, everyone on the internet noticed, Mr. Premier, that you got your hair cut on the weekend. Um, first of all, I'm a little envious, but uh, I'm sure there's a story. <laughs> well, there, you know, there, there is. I, I look like a sheepdog, and, and uh, so we literally got some dog clippers, and I got it on video to prove it. Or I know you guys are going to want to see it, but my daughter that lives at home has never cut anyone's hair in their life. I just sat in the chair and said, honey, go to town. And, uh, you know, we couldn't even figure out how to work these clippers. And I grabbed them and zinged half my head so it's half bald on one side. And that, that's what happened. But, you know, on a, on a more serious note, my, my heart breaks for these barbers and hairstylists, you know, that have been shut down forever. It really does. Uh, and and I, I'm going to do everything I can 
to get you back open. And I promise you, that'll be the last time, as much as my daughter did an incredible job for a rookie, um, I'm going back to uh, the barbers and, and I encourage everyone, uh, just please, when we get back to opening up, uh, these people have been hurting uh, so much, as much as a lot of people. So please just go out when we get open, go out and get your hair cut and get your hair styled and, and everything. So that, that's, that's my message there. But yeah, it was my, my daughter that lives at our home that uh, trimmed it up. I, I feel like, uh, you know, it, it worked two ways. I got my hair cut and I lost five pounds when she chopped the hair off. And God knows I got about another 60 more uh, pounds to go. So anyways, thank you, everyone. And uh, God bless. Thanks, everyone.